Great. Uh, again, welcome everyone. Uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome to this uh, embedded UI uh, webinar from ST Microelectronics and uh, TouchGFX. My name is Soren Mikkelsen and uh, I'm an account manager at ST and TouchGFX and I will be your host for today. Uh, our subject uh, for today is choosing the right embedded display and touch solution. Uh, and especially choosing the perfect display for your embedded UI project can be challenging. Uh, uh, the display itself is one of the most expensive and important hardware components in your setup. Um, and the display is the interaction point for the end user. So having the right size, fitting a specific environment, and also meeting the expectations of smartphone look and feel is challenging. Um, we at uh, GFX uh, have had a lot of questions about this topic. Um, and this webinar today is to help you make the right, right choice. Uh, so we hope you'll find it uh, beneficial for uh, attending this webinar. Uh, next slide, please. Um, with me today, uh, we have the Managing Director of EDT uh, Europe, Michael Melvang, who will take you through the different topics. Uh, yeah, hi, Michael. Uh, before handing over the microphone to you, um, let's meet some uh, one of the people behind the scenes uh, and uh, ready to answer some of your questions. Uh, say hello to Jan Mugin. I think he will come in from uh, from the side here. Great. Um, yeah, and please ask a lot of questions. I can already see you. Uh, you are asking some. Uh, he is ready to answer it, and uh, some of them we will be taking up uh, here at the webinar. Um, yes, next slide. Uh, we are using GoToWebinar, and uh, this is the setup, and you can use questions and chat, and we will also have some polls uh, to get your inputs on different areas uh, and, and some info. And I think we should uh, try one out. Uh, I'll find a poll here uh, to see what level of uh, display and touch solution knowledge you have. Um, so let's launch this poll, and you can uh, put in your vote, and let's see uh, where you are. Um, and uh, while we're waiting, uh, please note that, uh, again, this webinar is recorded, so uh, we will make this available afterwards. Uh, when attending, you'll get an automatic email with the uh, recording, and we will also share this on our website, both on the TouchGFX website and I think also on the EDT website. Um, yes, and I will close the poll now and share the result. I can see uh, it's uh, good average and poor uh, level of knowledge and I think this is uh, really great. Um, I hope you can learn uh, as much as I can for, on this webinar. Um, yes, great. I will hide this poll again and I will hand it over to you, Michael, and uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, Soren. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, Thank you very much for being given this opportunity to uh, tell a little bit about embedded displays and to present uh, uh, the company uh, that I work for. And uh, but first of all, I think it's it's important for you guys to know uh, who is sitting behind the camera or actually in front of the camera. Um, my name is Michael. I have been with EDT since 2012. Um, I have 20 plus years experience in the uh, industrial display uh, field and um, especially uh, displays and touch solutions um, has been my, my, my focus um, for, for many years. So what do we aim here? Uh, what's in it for you uh, spending this hour? We do hope to share some experience uh, that we have been uh, collecting over uh, many, many years. And uh, by doing that, we hope to give you a chance to, to get a, a shorter way to your marketplace. Um, and by doing that, I mean designing your product with, with a good a high level of reliability and also being very confident about what we're doing uh, is certainly uh, a very beneficial aim that we are trying to, to, to achieve here. Uh, especially also um, want to enable you to make a good choice uh, when you select a display or a supplier uh, for your embedded display. Um, so that's the aim to try and give you some ideas and some thoughts and, and forgive me if I sometimes uh, have my EDT hat on, I'll try to take it off as often as I can, uh, obviously. Um, 
So let's see what we can do here. On the agenda today, we are, uh, I will give you a short presentation of, of the company so you know uh, what, uh, what we are about and, and why we are here. Um, and I will also then uh, dig de deeper into the technical issues that uh, has been on the agenda since you registered for this uh, webinar. Um, and then, of course, there will be uh, also a, a question and answer session after the webinar. But you are, as uh, Soren has pointed out, you are more than welcome to place your uh, questions uh, along as we go. And I can see from the poll here that we uh, have a majority of, of people with a relatively low knowledge about uh, display. So I'm sure there will be lots of interesting questions uh, all through the, the seminar. So, yeah, about EDT, um, we are a Taiwan-based company. We uh, were founded in 1994 and we are listed on the stock market in, in Taiwan, in Taipei. Um, be free to go there. And uh, in total, we are about 1,200 employees uh, worldwide. You can see on the pictures on the left side, there's uh, our headquarter in Kaohsiung, that's in southern Taiwan. And we have our factory a few blocks away, uh, main factory. And that factory, we built displays, we built uh, touch panels, and we do optical bonding. We build everything together. Uh, we do a lot of uh, product development in, in Kaohsiung factory. And then when we have uh, designed things, we are moving into uh, assembly production of some of the smaller displays. We uh, tend to move the, some of the production to our uh, production site in Dongguang in, in China. So why are we here uh, today, sitting here together to, with, uh, with Touch GFX and the team? Um, it's primarily because we have uh, been searching a long time for a good solution in terms of uh, value adding to our display and touch modules. And a few years ago, we started developing this uh, new concept of ours called Smart Embedded. Um, and this has now resulted in, in three uh, basic standard evaluation kits, um, as you can see uh, on the slide here. Uh, we have made a standard module with a 4.3 inch display. We have made another one with a 7 inch display and we have one with a 10.1 inch display. All featuring the, uh, the STM32 F7 series uh, MCU from ST Microelectronics and uh, with the Touch GFX uh, GUI framework uh, to, to uh, present the, uh, the graphics. So it's a very agile and, and smooth system that we have uh, put together here. We have a question. Yes, I think it's a good point taking up one of the questions which is relevant here. Uh, it says, uh, Michael, uh, where can I buy these modules and uh, can I just buy one? Um, well, it's an evaluation kit, uh, so of course you can buy one. And the best place to, to get it is uh, to contact some of our partners or distributors. Uh, we do have a worldwide coverage, so we do have uh, facilities in, in the US. Uh, we have two in, uh, in US, one is in, in Boston, that's the main, and we have in Irvine, California, so east and west coast are covered. Uh, and there's a lot of reps in the uh, territory who will be uh, supporting you locally if you're on that side. Uh, and here in Europe, you are welcome to contact our partners, our distributors, um, or contact ourselves uh, in, in, in Denmark. Uh, you will later on get a, an a email address uh, that you can contact. And you can, of course, also, if you're from Asia, I don't suspect there will be that many from Asia attending this seminar right now. Uh, but of course, there's also uh, possible to buy it out there. OK. Right. So let's go on with it. Let's dig deeper into the embedded display. So uh, many people consider uh, a display to be just an off the shelf item, something you can go out and grab in any corner. Um, but it's actually a very, very complex system, especially if we have a, a touch display as, as uh, we're showing on the screen here. Uh, it consists of a lot of uh, different materials and components that has to be combined in the right way and has to be sourced from the right, right sources uh, to form a good embedded display. Um, so there are some key questions that 
we feel uh, is necessary to ask yourself and actually more important to communicate and have a dialogue with your supplier directly and uh, make sure to get involved very early in the process because the, the closer contact you have, the, the, the better dialogue you have with your supplier, the better the chances that you will get a good solution in the end. <clears throat> so first of all, let your supplier know who is, uh, what is the application, who is using your device, um, what kind of functionality are you after, and especially uh, which environment uh, do you want your uh, device to operate in? That's uh, very, very critical questions. And second question is uh, concerns actually uh, a commercial uh, angle. Uh, how long are you planning to have your product in the market? How many times are you willing to, to invest in, in, in redevelopment in terms of uh, when a, a component or a material reaches end of life scenario, et cetera? Um, so that's a very, very uh, unique, uh, some, some questions that you have to, 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 to be aware of. Um, and then, of course, we can we can dig into the the technical details and uh, the technical require, uh, requirements that you will be facing. Um, but just to give you some some idea, if you if you if you're looking at at a consumer display, I mean, everybody carries around a very very advanced and modern display in their pockets. Uh, perhaps the most advanced that you can get in the market. So naturally, the expectations will be very high when you uh, go into uh, a display project uh, from the start. But it's not always very practical to, to have that uh, kind of approach. So you need to, to discuss with your, uh, with your supplier and, and be aware. So let's look into the technical stuff. What's uh, if, if we take such a display apart, um, it, you will see it consists of, of some module solutions, basically. In principle, you will have the, the driver board uh, to interface it. It can contain an LED driver or maybe a converter uh, converting the signal from uh, LVDS to parallel RGB or, or whatever. Um, I'll come into those interfaces a little bit later for those of you who are not so familiar with them. Um, secondly, it will contain a display, obviously, to show the information. That's the kind of the face of your product. Remember that the, the display and the touch is the face of your product. Um, then we will have some kind of bonding to, to attach the, the capacitive touch sensor or a touch sensor. It doesn't necessarily need to be a capacitive one, but obviously, if you are considering to combine it with a cover lens to protect it, that's the second thing. Um, then obviously you will need some kind of capacitive uh, technology, uh, and then of course uh, not to forget your your framework, your your uh, user interface uh, software. Um, but that's a different seminar. We will dig more into our smart embedded solutions uh, later on uh, in uh, November probably. So digging into the displays, yeah, what kind of questions do we ask ourselves there? I'd say uh, display technology, you will be uh, faced very, very often with uh, at, uh, what we call an active LCD technology. It's, it's, uh, also, the technical term is, is, is TFT is very often used. Uh, but most of you, if you are not so familiar with that, will know from your supermarkets that you can buy LCD TVs. Um, and in principle, a TFT, panel is made with liquid crystals, hence the liquid LCD, um, and it is transistor driven. So it's an active display technology. And there are generally, I mean, obviously there are other types available, but the most common ones are the, the TN based, uh, which is a very industrial type. And then there is the IPS MVA type that uh, arrive of uh, origins from the consumer market uh, originally and now gets more and more um, integrated and, and uh, into the industry uh, field uh, as well. So, but then of course the, there is the, the general requirement for those technologies come from a desire to have very 
wide viewing angles of the display. And actually, there are some some tri tips, uh, small tricks that we can can put, like adding a, an SVB film on the TN display to uh, achieve a better viewing angle. We will come into that a little bit later. So since the majority of projects uh, that uh, is seen in the market generally today uh, are based on TFT, so this presentation will primarily uh, use that term TFT and be focused on concentrating on that. However, there are still some other technologies like the, uh, uh, well, it's, it's not maybe the, the right term to call it a legacy product, but uh, you will recognize the monochrome LCD display from many applications. And that's very, very good display if you're looking for long-term uh, availability. And it's uh, generally available. It's easy to drive if you have a, a small microprocessor system. So we still see some projects uh, arising from, from, from this technology. And then, of course, we cannot forget and overlook the uh, the uh, uh, e-paper technology, which is good for s signage, um, um, warehouse uh, uh, price tags, etc., where you don't need to update the information on the screen very often because it requires some high power to update the screen and then you can take off the power and then the image will stick on until you update it again. That's a benefit. Um, on the other hand, um, you can't read it if there's no ambient light to, to uh, reflect it. So, and of course, like I said, the advanced uh, modern uh, smartphones will be using maybe an OLED display. A uh, very nice technology that we do expect to see also rippling into the uh, industrial market uh, within the next few years. However, availability at the moment is still on a consumer level. So this is uh, not something that we can consider for an industrial product at the moment. <clears throat> right. So the next uh, thing to discuss when uh, looking at a display is usually people will ask about the brightness. Um, and uh, TFT display need a backlight to, to, to show an image. Most TFTs are what we call transmissive. Um, there are some TFTs available with a transflective technology uh, where you don't need to activate the backlight to, to be able to read it, but the number of suppliers is fairly limited. So uh, uh, the most commonly displays are still the, the with an active or a transmissive uh, requiring a backlight. So we have put together here um, a small table showing you uh, the power consumption because the power consumption uh, uh, in a display is, is widely defined by the backlight. Uh, it is by far the most power consuming uh, part of the uh, TFT display. So keep that in mind for the parts that will come later when we start talking about sunlight readability. And we do have another question, Soren. Uh, yes, we have a question about uh, how much backlight should I have uh, for an outdoor application? Well, that's actually a very good question. Um, it depends on the mechanical structure. Uh, it depends on the, um, uh, like for example, if you if you have a, a, a touchscreen. There are many other things to consider than just brightness when we talk an outdoor uh, application or sunlight readability uh, issue. Uh, I think as a rule of thumb, some 600 candela uh, would cover your demand uh, as a surface brightness. But again, if we don't have optical bonding, I'll come back to that point uh, later on, you might require a display with a much brighter backlight. Um, so you, later on in the seminar, we'll show you a little bit more uh, what this is about. Uh, but as a, as a general rule, we should cover it. And for those of you who are not familiar with the, uh, with the term candela uh, per square meter as being the measure units, some of you might know the, uh, the other unit called NITS. And uh, they are same, same. Um, but if you go to the supermarket and you buy a bulb, a LED bulb, you will often see the term called luminin. And that's another way of measuring uh, brightness. Um, but in the display world, uh, display industry, we use the term candela per square meter or NITS. Um, 
And there is another thing to, to notice here. We, we will come back to that, but it's quite important and interesting now that you mentioned it, Soren, because sunlight reliability, you have high brightness, uh, but that's also where you actually want to fight back the, 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 the brightness of the sun. So you need the higher brightness, and that reduces the lifetime of your LEDs because you will also have heat dissipating. So that's an issue here. This, this is example here shows you a comparison between three uh, typical seven inch displays with uh, different brightness levels and you will see we have different, different uh, lifetime of the LED backlight uh, as per definition and for those of you who don't know it the lifetime is defined as the time until the display reaches half brightness at 25 degrees measured at 25 degrees so, and that is where you or I really start seeing a significant change of brightness typically. All right. <clears throat> the third issue uh, concerning a display will be the uh, viewing direction or viewing position. And uh, you have to be careful not to mix that up with viewing angle. If you look in a data sheet of a display, you will find a, a definition called viewing angle. Um, and there is a general uh, misunderstanding there that if a display is defined as a six o'clock uh, viewing angle display, then the best viewing position will be from a six o'clock point. That's actually the opposite way around. I will explain that a little bit later, but just to keep that in mind, uh, it's due to the way we measure uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the viewing angles. It's measured by a contrast measurement device and uh, the eye just perceives it differently. And what happens is actually that from a six o'clock angle, you will, with a TN display, see what is called uh, grayscale inversion. So if you look at the picture here on the left, uh, this is the same display seen from different angles. Um, it's a TN display. It's a phenomenon that we see typically on TN TFT displays, not on uh, IPS or MBA displays. So this is just for TNs. And you will notice a significant uh, color inversion from the uh, below angle, which is not so significant if you look at from a, a, a above angle. And like I said, we do have some tricks that we can, uh, like an adding an uh, SVV film, which can help to, to increase the, uh, the viewing angle a little bit on, on the uh, TN display. And in many cases, that's enough. That's uh, just enough to get you going with a good solution, which is feasible, it's long-term available, and it's easy to implement and not so expensive. Right, then, whoops. Let's look into uh, the display resolution. <clears throat> now, if you're designing an embedded system, uh, you have often have chosen a CPU or have preferred a CPU that you want to use. And you will uh, design some software, but you also want to limit the, uh, the memory size uh, because your software needs to do this and that and a lot of uh, other things keep running than just showing graphic images on a display. So keep in mind, the higher the resolution you choose on the display, the more memory you will need and the more CPU power well, you also need uh, for computing and, and generating the the uh, the, uh, the graphics. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And secondly, choosing the right resolution is is has become very difficult over the, the few, last few years because of the uh, consumer electronics. As I said, uh, every brand wants to have its own unique standout and tend to make their own display with their own resolution. So uh, it's really hard to define a standard, but we can define like 3.5 inch with a quarter VGA resolution. I don't know if you are able to read the chart here. You can you can Google that. A quarter VGA means uh, actually 320 times 240 pixels if it is in a landscape mode. And if it is a portrait display, then it will be defined as a 240 times 320. Um, that's just one example. 4.3 inch is very common. Seven inch. Typically, with two different resolutions is available, same with 10.1 inch, but everything in between is 
yeah, what is available from this panel supplier and what is available from this panel supplier. Everyone tend to have their own cherries, but be careful. Uh, where do they, where do, do your display supplier source the panels, the, the, the key component here? Are they able to secure long-term availability? And how do they secure it? Very important questions to ask. And as I said, consider your needs. Uh, this is just three simple examples, uh, what kind of buffer size that you, are, you will actually uh, need if you are running displays with different resolutions and, and different color depth. Keep in mind that color depth is, is really where you also will uh, be facing some challenges, especially if you go up into 24-bit. Uh, it's quite a lot of data that you need to, to, to throw to the display. Unless, yeah, I keep doing that, that's fine, all right. Um, the interface, yeah, what's the best interface for a display? Well, um, in many cases, it depends on the on the CPU that you want to use. Uh, modern CPUs uh, are, actually come with some standard interfaces. Today, if you are using a very modern CPU, you might find uh, it's uh, equipped with a MEPI interface. Uh, but if you are using more, um, a little bit older generations of, of uh, display uh, or MCUs, you will find the display interface uh, parallel RGB is the very, very common interface. And um, let's dig into that. We do have a question here, so, Soren? I think bef uh, before we dig into the different interfaces, uh, I think we should do a poll uh, uh, saying which display the interface type is preferred for your next UI project. It would be interesting to see, um, yeah, what is the preferred one. I'll launch the poll now, and uh, just please, uh, please uh, quickly type in your question. Um, yes, and uh, I think we expect RGB to be uh, the most common used, but uh, but let's see uh, uh, what we'll get here. I think we will close the, the poll now, and I'll share the vote. RGB and SPI interface is the, is the most common use. Is that what you also expected, uh, Michael, or, or what do you say? Well, actually, yes. Uh, that's more or less what I would expect. I actually also find it interesting that so many are using uh, MEPI already. That's uh, a sign that the modern displays are commonly used because a MEPI interface is uh, mostly used in a very modern and found in very modern displays uh, like mobile phone displays, uh, tablet displays, where you have a very, very high resolution. The, uh, the alternative to MEP, if you're looking at a differential uh, signal, there would be the LVDS interface. And the LVDS is commonly known or uh, used in, uh, in uh, large size panels like 15.6, uh, 15 inch, uh, 12, 10 inch, and even down to seven inch if you have a resolution of uh, 1024 times 600. But below that resolution, it doesn't really make much sense unless you are striving at uh, running very, very long cable lengths. Um, and that is due to usually due to to, to noise issues, uh, but obviously with a higher resolution you will be running a much much higher pixel clock. Uh, so obviously it it comes down to to noise and uh, how much uh, can you protect your system uh, and and uh, and and do noise filtering. Um, yeah, we can do we can dig into it. Um, the SPI is an interface that is uh, used, especially for the smaller displays, typically, because uh, you have a limited uh, bandwidth there uh, in terms of speed. Um, and you can actually see here uh, the, the calculation. I'm not an expert in the interfaces. Let me just point that out. So, uh, uh, but it's uh, considered if you are, if you are want to show live video uh, on a on a display with a let's just say a, a VGA resolution or so you might want to consider using a, either an uh, or a, an RGB definitely for for live video but if it is uh, more like simple graphics but you want to change a little bit here and there uh, the MCU interface is actually also a very good option and most of these uh, displays actually come with um, 
especially the smaller displays below 3.5 inch actually per default uh, contains a, a, a display controller uh, on the glass, uh, chip on glass controller, which actually features both uh, MCU, SPI, uh, or parallel RGB. It's just a matter of how we wire it up uh, on the FPC. The MCU is a, a very nice feature. It actually ha has a small graphic controller built into it, and it has some memory. So you can upload the pictures to the memory, and you can fire them off uh, when you are ready to, to update the display, so you don't have to constantly uh, bit bang the, the, the data bus. Uh, or you can just simply tell the display or the controller to update a small portion of the display you don't need to update the entire uh, frames so that's uh, that's a very nice uh, feature actually the uh, RGB is very basic uh, you uh, basically have a, a, a frame clock so um, there are two ways of running an RGB signal. Uh, one is the, the sync mode and the other one is the DE mode. And uh, from our engineers, I have learned that uh, it is very wise to, to choose the DE mode because if you're running sync mode, you will have to have your clock and, and signals uh, synchronized and running in phase and uh, just small disturbances if they're not completely on, on time or on spot, you will see noise on your display. You will see uh, distorted images, uh, shadows, etc. So uh, the DE mode is, is definitely a much more safe uh, interface uh, solution for, for the uh, parallel RGB. And most of the display panels are still with a, a parallel RGB somewhere in the system. Um, converted into either MCU or uh, LVDS or MEP by a, a controller in the end. And finally, yeah, the uh, low voltage is the differential signal bus. You have two lines, two uh, per, per bit, and actually, when you they they will run in in opposite phase, so you can imagine if you have noise radiating into your your cable, uh, one will be showing this and the other one will be showing this, and since they are in same thing, they will equalize each other out. So it's not so noise sensitive actually. Will eliminate the noise by itself. Right. The um, yeah, I'm no more saying about that. Good. Remember, pop any questions as you uh, we go along. And then I'll switch over to the next topic here, which will be the, the uh, sensor, uh, because you want to interact with your display somehow. And uh, the touch sensor is a natural choice of doing that. It's very intuitive uh, designing a system. If you, are, uh, you have probably seen the, the uh, the advanced graphic systems uh, that uh, you can be done with a touch the effects uh, framework and it's very natural to put your finger on there and, and touch it uh, directly. Um, in general, there are two touch technologies um, commonly used. Uh, I would say though that most of the newer projects uh, are done with capacitive touch technology. Uh, the number of resistive touch manufacturers has dropped over the years. It's getting a little bit harder to uh, to uh, to find a majority of manufacturers. Hence, the prices are not decreasing as fast any longer as they used to. It is a, a, a mechanical technology. Uh, you have a PET layer. Uh, with ITO on the backside, and you have a glass backer typically with ITO. Uh, and ITO is, is a transparent material that when you, it's kind of acts as a conductor, so it's, it's electrical conducting material. When you press the two layers together, they obviously form a contact, and that can then be detected in either by a simple resistive touch controller or, as we write here, uh, just a simple uh, analog digital converter can actually act as, as, as a very simple uh, touch controlling uh, sensor. There are uh, a few, uh, four, five, six, eight, seven wire te technologies. Uh, most common are four wire. I've seen a few five wires over my career and even some, some seven and eight wires. Uh, depends on which manufacturer you, you buy them from. Um, however, as I said, 
today we do run into more and more into capacitive and the reason for that is actually if you look at the the con side of, of the uh, resistive technology um, uh, you cannot compare resistive technology with with a uh, the uh, capacitive technology in terms of uh, optical performance uh, or, or look and feel it's simply not on par um, it will require the activation force so if you want to do the same thing as you do on your tablet or in your smartphone meaning sliding your finger and doing rotating and simsing that's very difficult to do with a resistive touch there are a few manufacturers who actually have made some very very clever resistive touches that don't require a lot of activation force but you still have the 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 uh, the downside of a pet layer in front of the the user and pet the polyester uh, material gets scratches on the surface uh, with time. So uh, we tend to, to see a lot of customers uh, asking more and more for, for a glass type of, uh, of uh, touch and, and, and surface. So, and obviously you cannot make a vandal proof uh, touch screen uh, with a resistive touch panels. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, vending machines or ticket vending machines out there in the market, uh, typically 15 or 17 or 19 inch screens, and people have cut them through uh, with a, either a knife or uh, scratched them with a key. Some are vandals, some are just uh, careless, uh, pointing with sharp objects, and uh, the resistive touch is definitely not a friend with, uh, with sharp objects. And furthermore, since you will have an air gap between the two layers always, uh, the sunlight readability uh, uh, is really not easy to achieve with a resistive touch. So what is this capacitive touch technology about? And I do seem to have a small issue with my laptop here. Sorry for that. Can we have some questions? Um, you can use uh, gloves on a capacitive touchscreen. Uh, I have seen the the, uh, the the gloves that uh, you can buy, which is handy when you want to use a glove and your uh, on your uh, smartphone, uh, because those technologies are not really suited for for glove usage. Um, but the um, we there there is technology available in the markets where you can use uh, gloves uh, even thick gloves uh, or like medical gloves uh, that are thinner so that is definitely feasible uh, we are at that stage now it used to be a bit of a problem but uh, yeah today we have solved that um i'm sorry i need to reboot my my presentation yeah, it's fine. Uh, okay. and while you're doing that uh, michael i think we should launch another poll and get your input on what you find uh, most important when sourcing uh, a display. Uh, just do that right away. Right away. I don't hear this yet. Sorry, I think uh, something happened to my microphone. Uh, please, type uh, please type in uh, what you think is most important when sourcing a display. And, uh, and uh, yeah, let's see uh, what, the what the results will be in a few seconds. Uh, Michael is uh, restarting his PowerPoint presentation. Um, just wait a few seconds. Well, also about questions, please keep them coming. Um, we see a lot of questions, but uh, I think my colleague Jörn can handle a few more. He's not sweating yet, but uh, let's see if uh, we can get close to that. Um, I will close the poll and share one. Um, yes. Uh, yes, and we have price as number one, uh, of course, and uh, quality is also one important factor. Um, great. I think we are live again from uh, Michael. Um, yes, I'll hand it over to you again, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot to switch off on my phone um, or on my mic. So I think we are back now. The um, capacitive touch technology is uh, the most uh, widely used technology today in modern electronics. Um, there are generally single finger touch available and there are multi-touch uh, finger or multi-finger uh, 
te te technologies out there. <clears throat> It's uh, something you need to, to consider is what do you need to have? Um, do you want swipe or sliding features or do you want zoom or rotating? Uh, I mean, if you're talking zoom and rotating, you will typically be looking for a dual finger or multi-finger uh, system. If it is swiping or sliding, then it can be solved with a single finger uh, touch sensor. And uh, yeah, what kind of glove we touched down on that. It can also work in a, in a humid or moist environment. Early days, or we, we were not able to, to solve that problem. But today we are actually able of, of uh, delivering uh, touch panels, which uh, can work with, uh, let's say, a limited amount of water on it. Um, what you would also have to consider is uh, the environment, uh, as I pointed out to the beginning. If you are uh, doing a public application device, you will need to consider how to protect your your, your device. And that uh, comes down to uh, kind of you have to add a cover lens in general. And uh, then it's a question, can your touch sensor actually work with a cover lens or can it not work with a cover lens, etc. And definitely you will need to consider some kind of improvements for outdoor readability or uh, even uh, vandal proofing. So let's look a little bit about the, the, the two technologies uh, most commonly used. For single touch, uh, the self-capacitance technology was the most uh, uh, often uh, used. And it's actually very good. You can imagine you have a, a sensor glass with uh, uh, some electric field uh, hovering over it. And when you approach the field with your finger, then something happens. You change the electrical field. The uh, self-capacitance actually pulls from that, as you can see on the on the uh, uh, illustration there. It actually pulls away uh, some of the signal into the ground, and uh, that makes it able to detect uh, a touch, even there is water on the uh, on the sensor. On the other side, you have the mutual capacitance technology, and that's basically you have two two sensors. You have a, a drive electrode, and you have a, a sensing electrode, or also uh, sometimes also referred to as an X and Y. Um, and between those layers, there is a capacitive field, and when your finger approaches, you will change that capacitive field, and that'll be detected in the system. And hence, since it is a, a, a multi-touch system, you will actually be able to touch it with five, six, uh, up to ten fingers, uh, depending on the uh, on the uh, on the sensor and the controller. That technology is, however, a little bit of a, a challenge uh, if you have water on, and uh, you can imagine why, because your finger acts as a bridge, water will act as a bridge. But with a, a limited amount of water on it, it can still detect it. But once you start sliding your finger around, then the, 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 uh, the controller gets confused and is not really sure where is the, the, the real touch that I want to detect. But today, actually, we have some very nice uh, new controllers that work with both technologies integrated. And it can actually switch from one mode to the other mode. And it can detect if there is water on the glass. Then it can switch to self-capacitance and uh, only enable single technology. And if uh, the water is wiped off or running off, then it can switch back to the mutual capacitance technology, meaning you can start using two fingers again or more. But if you have a very thick cover glass uh, on top of it, then obviously the sensitivity will be reduced. So there is always a compromise to be reached there. Some details. Be aware, uh, the capacitive touch sensor, there is a lot of patents out there in the market. Um, EDT, we have 148 patents already granted in 2017. We applied for 10 more. Um, so it's it's quite important to, to have your patent uh, on here. Um, some years ago, yeah, one of the big A's in the US had their patent and it was an issue. Uh, so just be careful uh, where you get your sensor from and uh, what kind of uh, security they give you. Enough of the capacitive touch technology. As I said, you need to protect your your skin. 
um, or the face of your product. And the cover lens is a good way of doing it. Um, the general protection is, is besides protect uh, the sorry the general purpose is besides the protection also uh, branding um the uh, the 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 uh, the this the display is your face it's it's your company face to the public keep that in mind and by doing a clever logo design or uh, uh, a nice graphic design on your cover glass uh, maybe shape it uh, kindly different to stand out of the crowd you can actually achieve uh, a very nice looking product and uh, even though you use a very very uh, standard display but with the right uh, GUI, with the right user interface, and with the right uh, cover glass printing and, and shape, you can have exactly your own identity uh, built just from this various, uh, I wouldn't call it a simple system, but it's, it's because it's fairly advanced. But that's what it is. <clears throat> and uh, you will need to consider the material, the thickness of the material, obviously the protection level that you're looking for is quite important in terms of uh, uh, impact strengths typically. And um, then, of course, we can talk about the surface treatments. Like I said, if you can have water running off more easily, then you can achieve a better uh, sensitivity and a better touch function. Uh, hence, uh, some kind of uh, anti-fingerprint treatment may uh, be the best choice for that. Finally, of course, not to forget, the the bonding and integration of this uh, of this uh, display touch system is really really vital for your protection level so let's dig a little bit into that what do we mean yeah we have a question yes uh, just one question before we continue um, we have a question from the audience asking do you think uh, michael water and humidity pcap problems are the mostly Controllers problem or the sensors problem? It is mostly the controllers problem, but of course <laughs> you will need to have the um, uh, a clever uh, sensor design. If you don't have the right pattern, which is uh, tuned in for the uh, for the controller, um, then you might have difficulties reaching the level of sensitivity that you are after. Um, I think that should answer the question. It is definitely a question of the controller, but also, of course, uh, who is delivering the system to you? Do you have a good access to the uh, uh, to get the, the right tuning of your software? Uh, because that is really, really essential to any capacitive system. You need to have a good tuning uh, facility or some some guys who can do a good job for you there. I mentioned about vandalism um, and vandalism proof. It's quite obvious that you, the thicker the glass, the more safe you would feel. Actually, if you put two three millimeter glass together and you laminate them, you will have a very strong uh, 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 impact strength um, compared to a six millimeter glass. So a laminated structure is actually very good uh, in terms of uh, absorbing the shock. Then, of course, obviously, there is different kinds of glass available. Uh, normal window glass, we typically call that a soda lime glass, uh, can be chemically strengthened, hence the, the term CS glass for chemically strengthened glass. And then you will maybe face, be faced also or meeting the, the term tempered glass in the, in the market. And it's come down to how do uh, the, the, the splinters break up uh, when they break. Tempered glass will break into tiny splinters, uh, while a CS glass or a soda lime glass or even a gorilla glass will, will uh, break into to bigger splinters. Um, <clears throat> so that is to, to be considered when designing your system. The gorilla glass is mentioned here. It's just a brand, uh, but not just any brand. It's, it's really a, a brand which is quite important, has been used for many uh, smartphone applications uh, over the time. Uh, but if you're looking for a six millimeter Gorilla Glass, you would have to come up with a lot of money. Um, and obviously there are other brands out there available uh, that you can get at a better price. 
so it comes down to the project. What are your basic requirements? What do you need to have? And, and what then presents a reasonable alternative in terms of uh, price performance relation. Obviously, uh, it's also possible to add a plastic cover lens but you will have to consider that a PMMA or plastic cover lens will need a hard coat surfacing uh, uh, to, to achieve a, a good scratch resistance. Typically, it's, it's, it's very easy to scratch a plastic surface. And it also bends and twists a little bit more than, than glass. Glass is, is quite flat, if you look at it. And, uh, and therefore, we have a lot of uh, uh, restraints concerning uh, uh, plastic material uh, as, a, say, as a cover lens material. Furthermore, the uh, material constant epsilon, that's the electrical um, conductance through the material, is, is double as, uh, as, as high in, in, uh, in a plastic cover glass and in glass. So you can only have the half thickness of the cover glass in comparison to, of, of, a, of a PMA in comparison to, to glass material. So I've been mentioning this bonding structure quite a many times. If we have a cover lens, we have a sensor, and we have it then bonded together optically. And then there's a display. If we fill that material, that uh, air gap out with uh, optical bonding, you can see it's a very solid structure in comparison to the structure with air gap. This is a very typical uh, uh, structure used in, in, uh, in, in most uh, industrial applications, but nowadays, uh, a lot of customers tend to will want this uh, optical bonding instead. And that comes down to the uh, outdoor and sunlight availability, which we have touched on a few times. It's quite important. So uh, when you are in an outdoor, you have sunlight, you have UV. Be careful of that. Make sure to protect it. Most displays, TFT displays, contain a, a UV a filtering polarizer, so that's fine. However, the paint on your cover glass may not uh, resist UV light very well. And uh, so you will want to use like a ceramic printed uh, glass, for example, um, to, to have a, a, a strong solution out there. Then we have heat and we have a lot of reflections. And uh, that is the next topic here. You can obviously boost the black light uh, intensity 500 times or whatever, or five times. But by doing that, you will also burn uh, five times more uh, uh, watt uh, or effect uh, out of your system. So you will have a, a lot of more heat to deal with internally. And um, that's uh, that's quite a, a tricky thing because you will be reducing the lifetime of your of your display significantly by doing that. Furthermore, the reflections is is really critical here. So uh, the way to overcome that is most oftenly, yeah, you can you can take a transflective display, a transflective TAT display. They are there out there, but the number of panel suppliers is fairly limited. Hence, the prices are also quite in the high end. So the most common way is to uh, do the optical bonding, it improves the contrast and the brightness and even the viewing angle experience of your uh, device will be improved. It uh, also fills out the air gap where condensation often occurs. So by optical bonding, you will have no condensation issue, at least not between the display and the CTP touch sensor. Inside the unit, that's a different choice, that's a different uh, webinar. And then of course, you will not have dust particles or insects that can enter the visible area of the display simply because it's, there is no air gap they can come in. So the mechanical impact strengths, we've been showed that on the previous slides. But these reflections here, what is it? Any air to glass transition or glass to air transition will introduce 4% uh, reflection. And that reduces your contrast by 4%. And contrast is the essence, that's the key. You want to have a highest possible contrast in a, a sunlight readable display. So on this example, you can see here, we have 12% reflection coming from each time uh, the, the light passes through a uh, transition in comparison to the optical bonded one. And here we have also taken the liberty of adding some kind of anti-reflection coating on the surface, which can help to reduce the top reflection to some 0.5% or so. So here you are looking at maybe a, a system with a 
yeah, 0 0.7, 0 0.8% or even best case here, 0.6% reflection, which is really, really good. So how does it look? Um, this uh, picture here shows it may be a little bit uh, 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 schematic, but it clearly explains that the, the, the right side of the display uh, is uh, having an optical bonding and the left side is, is without optical bonding. And it'll actually look like that if you take it outside in a display outside in, uh, in uh, the sunlight. I don't think I need to dig more into the uh, ways of optical bonding, but there are commonly two types of optical bonding way. One is the optical clear adhesive and the other one is the optical clear resin. Uh, it's two bonding methods. The resin is, is a glue that you apply and you have to be careful that it does only go where you want it to go. It should not enter the display where the OCA is a material that is mechanically uh, put on the glass. Uh, in there and, and you can remove the air bubbles that will automatically appear by uh, some kind of uh, autoclave process where you pull them out. But in any case, make sure that your supplier do a proper job in the, in, uh, in the um, curing process uh, because if that material is not cured properly, you might encounter some issues over time with peeling or uh, air bubbles re-entering uh, where they're not supposed to be. And uh, that is definitely not wanted. One way I mentioned about adding surface treatment, like uh, an anti-reflection treatment to remove some of the reflection on the surface, uh, there are various ways of surface treatments available. Uh, commonly used is the anti-reflection. Um, and uh, yeah, my glasses have anti-reflection, otherwise uh, you would probably see a lot of shiny lamps uh, in there. Uh, just to show the, the practical example, what, what is that? If we add uh, anti-reflection, we also want to add uh, what is called an anti-fingerprint coating. And the reason for that is uh, that the anti-reflection uh, treatment is, is fairly soft in the surface. Um, it is not so robust, so by adding the anti-fingerprint, we can actually increase the, the uh, scratch resistance of the, uh, of the uh, coating. Um, the anti-fingerprint is, is a very nice and very hard coating. It's actually also the feature that uh, enables your fingerprints to be easily wiped off the glass uh, of your sensor. We cannot avoid fingerprints to come on the glass. Uh, that's, uh, they will come there, but they're easy to wipe off. Um, and as I said, it, it repels, it helps to repel the water. So if you have anti-fingerprint, the water will easily run out. There's an anti-glare one. That's a kind of slide of Milky White uh, on the surface. And it's also commonly requested because if you have anti-glare, it kind of stands out uh, in comparison to, to common consumer uh, electronics like tablets or smartphones that typically has a, a more shiny and glare surface. Uh, so that's one way we can do it with an, an etched anti-glare, which is very doable, or we can do it with spray coating, which is uh, less doable, but also a more low cost solution, obviously. And then of course we can add some antibacterial treatment, but I think uh, surface treatments could be a subject for, for another webinar, perhaps in another time. Right, so coming to a conclusion here. Um, yeah, we meant to share some experience um, and to hopefully give you some ideas or to some key uh, knowledge that enables you to get a, a faster approach reaching your market and uh, a little bit of reliability and confidence I hope to have brought over to you guys and uh, certainly enabling you to make a good choice. And as you see, our logo says EDT, it's the clear choice. Uh, so why not? I mean, that's very obviously. So keep in mind, we do have our smart embedded solutions. That's why we are here. We will be hosting another webinar together with TouchDFX. Uh, we plan for it in November. The date will come out later. They, uh, keep in mind, you can buy these uh, smart embedded evaluation kits which contains of a touch displays system with the uh, STMIM uh, platform on the back and a touch the effects 
software already included. So you can uh, download the, uh, the GUI builder and start playing with it right away. So where do we get support? And uh, we have a website where you can find your local contact points on there. And just to show you here, I think this is where I want to hand over the uh, the uh, microphone again to uh, to Soren and say thank you very much for for joining in and and listening in. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yes, as uh, he mentioned, uh, we will uh, soon uh, have a webinar addressing the smart embedded solution from EDT, uh, and we will address also the TouchGFX part of this. If you go to touchgfx.com and download our TouchGFX version you can actually find their uh, display modules in the designer alongside with uh, different STM32 kits, evaluation and discovery kits. And uh, yeah, it's it's plug and play actually. Um, so this is really great. Uh, please uh, download it for free and, uh, and try it out if you want. Next slide, please. Um, Upcoming webinars, as I mentioned, we have the Smart Embedded, uh, but next week we have uh, another subject uh, which is not hardware related, but uh, in terms of graf graphics. Our partner, Mjolnir Informatics, uh, is our partner at this webinar, and we will address uh, user uh, responsiveness and animations um, called Making Your Application Come Alive. Uh, this means that uh, we will uh, make sure, uh, or we will show you how to have a UI which respond accordingly to the user's expectations and so on. I hope to see a lot of you there. Um, also, I would like to address some uh, things ha happening in the US. Uh, we have different hands-on seminars uh, on uh, advanced graphics on STM32 and TouchGFX. Uh, more info will come, and uh, if you would like, I can share it with you uh, perhaps next week uh, where these hands-on seminars will be and also where you can sign up. Also, we have a webinar. If you visit ST uh, and go to the webinar page, you will find a webinar uh, called Enhancing User Experience with TouchGFX. This is uh, from our US colleagues. Uh, and if you do not know uh, TouchGFX, this is a great way to get a really good introduction. Um, and if you have any ideas or any uh, sub uh, topics you want us to address in a webinar, please let us know and uh, we will take them into consideration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, and please write us if you have any questions, um, both related to STM32, TouchGFX, embedded UIs, displays, and so on. Uh, we are happy to help. Um, we will also do a survey after this webinar, uh, and I hope you will uh, help us and, uh, and answer this. Um, and lastly, I would like to say that it's been great seeing all of this interest for this webinar. Uh, and I have learned a lot today, and I think you also, uh, or I hope you also have gained valuable knowledge uh, for your next UI project. Um, we will continue providing you with these uh, webinars relating to embedded UIs. Uh, and if you have any suggestions again to other topics we should cover, please uh, share it with us. Um, I would like to say uh, yes, thank you, Michael, for for sharing all your knowledge with us today, and uh, yeah, and that's it for us for for tonight in Denmark. And uh, yes, and thank you again for attending, and uh, have a good night or good morning.